Lesson three, you cannot change what you do not measure. So one of the core principles around changing habits is to track the progress of your clients and to acknowledge their success. Whenever I'm working with clients to modify any aspect of their life, I first meet with them to discuss their problem, assess their level of motivation, and clearly identify their goals. I then design the appropriate baseline assessments to track progress on those goals. Given that I work with a high performance organ, the brain, I inspire those that I work with to achieve health and fitness goals to put them in an optimized range versus a normal range. In this lesson, you'll learn why this is important as a brain fitness coach. So the question becomes, how do we modify our habits to achieve our desired goals? In order to address this question, we need to understand how our mind operates. Our subconscious mind wants to keep us safe, so it is very resistant to change. Even when we are excited to make changes in our life, the subconscious likes what feels safe and familiar, so it often stays rooted in behaviors that may no longer serve us. It can bring up feelings of fear of the unknown, resistance to change in forming new habits, and doubt that you can do it, all of which makes achieving these goals feel like an insurmountable obstacle. This is also where 70% of the negative thoughts become important to identify and diffuse. However, once the subconscious believes that there's nothing to gain from holding on to the problem, it will often be open to change. In order to modify a habit, you first need to identify your goal. Is it weight loss within a specific time period? Is it a brain health goal based on medical concerns, for example, diabetes, hypertension, or risk of stroke? Is it training goal for sports, for example, running a marathon or preparing to play on a team? Next, you need to assess your client's motivation. Given that your client should be the one identifying their goal with your modifications based on your experience of how quickly they can achieve that goal, the motivation should be easily present. Are they doing this for themselves, their family, their loved ones? If it is a goal around health and fitness, those have long range implications. Many of my younger clients have motivating factors around vanity or wanting to look good for their partner, while my older clients are more motivated to stay fit and healthy so they could watch their grandchildren grow up. For each person, this will be individual, but they should list their motivation in a daily journal and may even post some type of sign around their home reminding them of why they wish to achieve this goal and why it is important to them. Track important metrics. In the next 10 slides, you will learn a series of metrics that you can use for your clients as it relates to brain health. Doing an initial baseline assessment and revisiting these metrics weekly, monthly, and at the end of your program will be very helpful in keeping your clients on track. Modify one habit per week. I've learned in coaching clients that some people want to go all in and implement multiple changes in the first week, while other clients are not as ambitious and may, making too many changes early on in a program could leave them feeling defeated. In my experience, having people commit to making one change per week and holding them accountable goes a long way towards success. With each week, you will ask them to maintain the new habits learned from the weeks prior. And if you're teaching a 10 week course, or coaching somebody over this time period, you will find that learning and implementing 10 new life changes can have a significant impact on an individual's life. Eliminating poor habits. As we coach our clients into embracing new habits, it is as important to support the elimination of habits that will not lead to attaining the desired goal. These poor habits may be our thoughts, our diet, our lifestyle, or our training style. Establishing a cadence of accountability is crucial for success. This is a strategy employed in many business settings and should be a part of your coaching practice. Work with your clients to establish when you're going to check in and monitor your progress towards your goal. Is it a daily one to five minute call? Is it a daily reading of a food journal or a weigh-in? Will this be done weekly? I recommend going no longer than one week if you're working to modify a habit. Reinforcement is key. We all need cheerleaders and people that we look up to and respect for support. There are many ways in which we can offer positive acknowledgement to our clients so that they do not feel defeated. 
Remember, this is not a race, it's a marathon. We want your client to enjoy the, this process of transformation in their lives. And this comes to my final recommendation of making it enjoyable. Clients are gonna be investing in you to guide them towards success. It is up to you to gauge their ability to embrace the changes you're recommending and to find creative ways to make the process fun. I like to create mini competitions for my clients to help support them reaching their goals, and I often provide rewards to my clients if they are able to achieve these goals. So one of the most important metrics that a brain fitness coach needs to know is your client's body mass index. Historically, the clients I've worked with are very uncomfortable with this number, as to be in the normal weight range, it means that your client is fairly lean. A majority of the clients I've worked with have their body mass index in the overweight to obese range. And you must be very mindful of how you share this information with your client, as we don't want to send them into a panic about their weight. It's just a number, and you should use this as a starting metric and then calculate the weight they should be at to fall into the normal range. The reason why this number is so important is that anyone who has a body mass index higher than the normal range most likely has inflammation in the body. We can confirm this with lab work, which is another metric I recommend acquiring, but an elevated body mass index is a risk factor for the presence of disease. Given that chronic inflammation is the foundation for all disease in the body, including diabetes, cancer, chronic fatigue, and degenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, it's imperative that you support your client in achieving this goal. You cannot be a brain fitness coach and not acknowledge this as a high priority goal. In the clinical setting, we would collect body mass index as well as a measure of the circumference of the waistline to readily assess if we were working with somebody who has metabolic syndrome. As a caveat, I want to acknowledge that if you're working with professional athletes like NFL players who may have a higher body mass to height index, we then use the waist to height ratio, which is where we measure the circumference of the waist and compare it to the height determine if the player is truly overweight. What you do is take the player's height in inches and divide it by two, and then compare it to the circumference of their waist. You're striving for a number where the waistline is less than half of the height. So for example, if you're working with someone who's six foot two or 74 inches, and they have a 44 inch waistline, which means you measure around the belly button, not below the belly, they are overweight. A six foot two inch player should have a waistline of 37 inches or less. Don't let them convince you that they're big bone to explain why they have a larger waistline. Trust me, I've heard it all. I will visit this topic in greater depth in our lesson on obesity. Conversely, clients who have a body mass index below 18.5 have a different issue. In these clients, we wanna make sure they're getting adequate foundational nutrients to support optimal brain and body function. These individuals may have issues around eating disorders and you may require the assistance of a medical professional in this circumstance. As a way to make this process easy, you can use the online body mass index calculator to get this metric. I have put my numbers in as a guide. So I'm six feet tall and I weigh 145 pounds, which puts me at a body mass index of 19.7. The circumference of my waist is 27 inches, which is well below the 36 inches that my height deems appropriate for my waistline. This is why you can see the waist to height ratio is a much better metric to use for men who have more lean muscle mass and may carry more weight than women. The next metric I recommend capturing is the number of calories your client consumes daily. This will be helpful in gaining an idea on what calorie range your client needs to be eating to get their body mass index in the normal range. Again, I've put my numbers into this calculator and according to my age, gender, height, weight, and activity level, I can eat up to 2,400 calories per day to maintain my current weight. It also gives caloric goals to help people structure their eating to lose one to two pounds per week, which is actually a very healthy way to release weight from the body. In my experience of teaching weight loss groups for years, I normally don't have women eat over 2,000 calories in any given day. As I am an endurance athlete, this calorie calculator has given me extra calories to account for my high activity level. 
I mention this as I want you to be conservative with your clients when using this calorie calculator. Do not give them reason to think that they can eat more calories than needed. Your best bet may be to use the no exercise setting to get the best caloric read for your clients. If they are semi-pro or professional athletes, marathon runners, boxers, etc., you should use the activity measure in determining their appropriate caloric intake. I have to share that one of the easiest things to change, but what most people are resistant to, is optimal hydration. Many brain issues, including brain fog, attentional problems, moodiness, irritability, and eating issues, can be ameliorated by adequate hydration. Many of you may have heard of the equation of drinking half of your body's weight in ounces of water for optimal hydration. This means that if I take my 145 pounds and divide it by two, I get 72, which means I should drink 72 ounces of water for adequate hydration. I'm also an athlete, so I need to provide extra fluids to replenish what is lost during training. So my solution is to drink three liters or 100 ounces per day. In my quest to optimize the hydration equation for my clients, I've come across a wonderful hydration calculator from www.camelback.com, which takes into account multiple factors in determining your daily water intake, which includes gender, height, weight, age, urine color, amount of sweat, exercise type, duration, and intensity, as well as weather conditions. In the next few slides, I'll walk you through how this calculator works. So as you will see, I can put in my gender, my height, my weight, and my age. They ask the condition of my urine. So the color of your urine will indicate if you're well hydrated or not. If it's medium to deep yellow, you need to hydrate more, preferably until it's clear. If it's clear or very light yellow, you're hydrating well. The only caveat to this is if you are taking a multivitamin with B vitamins or if you take a separate B vitamin supplement. This will turn your urine yellow, giving you a false positive indicating dehydration. They also ask how much I sweat during my workout, which I think is a wonderful addition to the calculation. Given that I run outdoors and sweat very little, my answer was very low on the scale. They then ask about my exercise for the day, including duration and intensity. They also ask about the weather conditions, including the type of weather and the temperature. So given my data points, this suggests that I should be consuming 1.1 liters per hour. I would take this to mean that during my exercise, I should consume a little over 33 ounces to replenish my fluids and then put this within the context of what I need to consume to be adequately hydrated for the day, which was 72 ounces. 72 ounces plus 33 ounces from my exercise comes out to 105 ounces, which is the equivalent of three liters of water for the day. This is why I think you can use both calculations with your clients to determine the optimal number of ounces of water for adequate hydration. The next metric I recommend you capture is how much your client moves throughout the day. There's a wonderful iPhone app called Steps that I admit I'm mildly obsessed with. Steps will calculate how many steps you've taken throughout the day and will give you daily metrics around your mileage and calories burned. It has set a goal of 10,000 steps per day for optimal health. So whenever I go over 10,000 steps, it puts me in the green zone. It also congratulates me when I've achieved this goal. If I don't achieve 10,000 steps, it changes to either an orange or a red color. Prior to using this app, I had no clue about tracking my movement. Once I started using steps, it got me even more engaged and mindful about always meeting the 10,000 daily step goal. Given that I'm a runner, I always meet my goal, but on days I don't run, I make sure I take the dog on long walks so I continue to move. I highly recommend using this app to track movement goals. As noted in the previous lesson, meditation is an important practice which serves to move energy or life force throughout the body, as well as quiet the nervous system, hone our powers of concentration, and to create a space of peace and tranquility in our lives. I'm excited that Muse has created a technology that allows us to measure our progress on achieving our meditation goals. 
In working with clients, whether one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting, I would often do a five-minute session at the end of our time together to teach them how to meditate. This also serves as a practice that when done together would serve to inspire them to do it at home. Once we are in the appropriate position, I would dim the lights and create a quiet space for us to practice. I set the timer on my iPhone so that would do a very serene wind chime when the time was up. Afterwards, I would ask what they experienced during our time together. It can be as simple as that to get started. So this is an image illustrating the metrics that are captured when using Muse. As you'll see from a three minute session that I did on August 22nd, the raw data at the top revealed that my mind was fairly active at the beginning of the session, as noted by the high amplitude of the waves during the first 45 seconds, but became significantly quieter at 1 minute and 30 seconds until the end of the session. From the raw data, they calculate the amount of time and percentage of time you spent in an active, neutral, and calm state. They've created a point system, which rewards you with calm points, which is the number of minutes I'm calm times three, giving me 407 points, as well as your recoveries, which is the number of time shifting from an active to a neutral state, which helps to build the skill of attention. <clears throat> In my case, I had two recoveries. And the number of birds that I heard, which represents when I'm calm for a long period of time. In my case, I heard the birds 15 times in three minutes. We can now compare the metrics collected on the 22nd with the ones collected on the 29th. As you can see from the raw data, I performed considerably better in the second session, spending no time in the active state and shifting into a calm state within 30 seconds. My improvements were clearly noted in the number of increased calm points going from 407 to 496, having zero recoveries, as I was in neutral or calm the entire session, and I heard more birds going from 15 to 26. So you can see this is a way to take meditation, make it a bit more fun for people, and it has a way to track and compare your metrics. The other fun aspect of this technology is that it captures how many minutes of meditation you do weekly, it challenges you to do a certain number of sessions per week, and it tracks your milestones. It will also send you messages reminding you to muse. I would be remiss if I did not strongly encourage all of your clients to get baseline blood work done. I strongly advise clients to go to their primary care physician to get this done annually, and the birthday is always the best time. As a brain fitness coach, you would be doing your clients a service by encouraging them to have these baseline labs done. While examining the results of these lab tests is beyond the scope of this course, the physician can serve to help your clients to get some of the metrics that are not in the optimized range back on track. In some cases, there may be an underlying metabolic, immune, or hormonal issue that may require the expertise of a physician or functional medicine practitioner to diagnose and treat. I will briefly discuss each test and give you some indicators of what you should be looking for. Clearly, anything out of the normal range will be your primary indicators of dysregulation in the body, but we can hone in on key elements that point to areas that need to be addressed in the diet and lifestyle. Metabolic panel. A comprehensive metabolic panel is a blood test that measures your sugar level, electrolyte and fluid balance, kidney function, and liver function. This is part of a regular health checkup and it will allow you to monitor any medical conditions. Fasting blood glucose. This is a test that is used as a diagnostic tool to identify if you are pre-diabetic or diabetic. It is only taken after an overnight fast. A blood sugar less than 100 milligrams per deciliter is considered normal. Levels between 100 to 125 are considered pre-diabetic and 126 or greater indicates diabetes. Optimized levels of blood sugar would be in the range of 80 to 90. If your client has a body mass index over 25, they should have their fasting blood glucose measured. Hemoglobin A1c. This blood test indicates the amount of sugar that has been circulating in the bloodstream over the last two to three months. It measures the percentage of blood sugar attached to hemoglobin, the oxygen-carrying protein in red blood cells. A level of 5.6% or lower is normal. 
5.7 to 6.4% indicates prediabetes and 6.5% or greater indicates diabetes. Lipid panel. The basic lipid blood test measures total cholesterol, triglyceride level, HDL and LDL cholesterol. It is used to determine your risk of heart disease. Cholesterol is required for the synthesis of steroid hormones and is a component of cell membranes. If we do not take in enough cholesterol from the diet, the liver will produce it. We want your cholesterol to be less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Triglycerides are the fats absorbed in the blood following a meal or are made by your liver in response to a diet rich in sugar, refined carbohydrates, and fats. We want your triglycerides to be lower than 150 milligrams per deciliter. HDL cholesterol is considered the good cholesterol as it helps to remove excess cholesterol deposits from the arterial lining. We want this number to be between 40 to 60 milligrams per deciliter. Diets high in saturated fats, refined carbohydrates, refined sugars, and high fructose corn syrup will yield a low HDL. High HDL comes from a healthy diet and exercise. And finally, LDL cholesterol is considered the bad cholesterol, as it deposits in the arterial lining and impairs blood flow. We want this number to be 99 milligrams per deciliter or lower. High LDL comes from inactivity, obesity, and diabetes, as well as diets high in refined carbohydrates, sugar, saturated animal fats, trans fats, and hydrogenated fats. Immune markers. A high sensitivity CRP test or C-reactive protein is used to identify the presence of inflammation in the body. This is often given for an acute condition causing inflammation or when someone has an inflammatory disorder such as arthritis, autoimmune disorders, or irritable bowel syndrome. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is a steroid hormone with multiple functions in the body, including calcium absorption, enabling normal mineralization of bone, as well as modulation of cell growth, neuromuscular and immune function, and reduction of inflammation. 30 nanograms per milliliter is deficient. 30 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, there's a risk for inadequacy at these levels, so striving for greater than 50, but not higher than 80, is considered a more optimized level. And finally, hormone panel. As hormone production declines with age, it is important to have an annual panel done to support mood, alertness, and feelings of well-being and optimal body function. In women, hormones like estrogen and progesterone not only play a role in conception and pregnancy, but they serve to maintain skin, hair, bone, kidney, and liver function. Progesterone is a natural calming agent to the nervous system. DHEA is a steroid hormone produced by the adrenals in the brain and is a precursor to testosterone and estrogen. Testosterone can enhance energy and lean body mass. A thyroid panel is used to evaluate thyroid function and help to diagnose hypo and hyperthyroidism. The thyroid is very important in the control of body temperature. If a person has a low body temperature, the functioning of the thyroid most likely is impaired. As thyroid dysfunction is linked to fatigue, weight gain, dry skin, constipation, and hair loss if hypo, and increased heart rate, anxiety, weight loss, and sleep issues if hyper, it's important to know if this needs to be taken into consideration when coaching your client. And finally, insulin is a hormone produced in the pancreas and helps to bring glucose into cells. A fasting insulin test can assess your risk for insulin resistance, which leads to type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and metabolic syndrome. I truly cannot say enough about the importance of sleep. It is one of the quickest ways to support your health as numerous regenerative and restorative processes occur when we are sleeping. At the end of the day, we have a buildup of toxicity in our cells, so it's natural for us to sleep and cleanse. Toxins are carried out of the cell by sodium and calcium via diffusion through the cell membrane and enter the lymphatic system and then enter the blood. The liver then extracts toxins from the blood, discharging it into the gallbladder which then goes to the duodenum, the colon, and then out of the body. Toxins are also released via the skin and the lungs. 
So we need to detoxify daily in order to stay healthy. If all is working well, you will wake up feeling refreshed and energized. If you're waking up feeling tired, then your body is not cleansing properly and the cellular exchange of electrolytes is most likely not functioning optimally. So why is restorative sleep so important? Well, sleep plays a powerful role in allowing us to process memories and emotions through the subconscious. It's postulated that we only use two to 10% of our conscious mind daily which means that 90 to 98% of our brain is engaged in subconscious patterns. One way to process reactive patterns is through delta slow wave sleep. When we're in this delta state, our brain is able to process emotions that no longer serve us. In addition, restorative sleep is involved in the consolidation of memories. What this means is that all the information that we take in during the day through our short-term memory can then be categorized into long-term memory when we sleep. So one of the most important aspects of sleep, which has come to light in the past few years, is the discovery of the glymphatic system, which is a type of lymphatic system or brainwash that occurs at night and is responsible for washing away toxic proteins. So improper functioning of the glymphatic system can result in the accumulation of amyloid plaques, which are the abnormally folded proteins that accumulate in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Given that Alzheimer's starts in the brain 20 to 30 years before the onset of symptoms, abnormal functioning of the glymphatic system as a result of chronic sleep deprivation is something that is preventable, but needs to be acknowledged as a growing epidemic. So given that many of us do not know what our sleep patterns are, I strongly recommend getting a sleep tracker like Up by Jawbone, which allows you to track the metrics around your sleep habits.